Um, so, you know, we, we saw that multiple, multiple agencies, NASA, NOAA, the JMA, Berkeley Earth, all came in in number six, this was uh, you know, the sixth place. Um, one of the things, I, I hope you don't mind, I might take it in a couple of different directions if that's okay. Sure. Um, can you speak to why it's important that, that different agencies have come to the same conclusion about our global temperature? Not to discount anything that NASA and NOAA is doing because it's very, very important. But can, can you speak to the, the importance about reproducing results in science? Oh, absolutely. I, I think this is one of the things that people really misunderstand about science. So there are these different organizations. And, you know, obviously, you know, in many cases, we're using the same data sets from satellites. Sometimes we're using slightly different data sets. There are, are different scientists using their own programs, their own computers to analyze the data. You know, the, the idea that, you know, the whole point of science is you have to be able to do an experiment and show people your data. And then everywhere in, around the world, should get more or less the same result. And of course, there's a little bit of scatter in that because people are doing slightly different things. But to me, that just means how strong the result is. So, you know, when people see a, you know, a scientific paper, it's not just one scientist that said, well, well, hey, I think this is a great idea. Look at my data. It has to go through peer review where scientists realize they can recreate the experiments. They can recreate the data themselves and get more or less the same result. So that, that's why we have confidence in the result is that many people around the world are getting the same or very similar results. That, that, that means it's a very robust, very strong result. So it's funny to me, this is so ingrained in what being a scientist means that I, I had to think there for a second. It's like, well, of course, you know, you want lots of people doing it and you want to scatter so you can figure out what are the parts that we don't understand. No, but, uh, but I think that's something people may not understand about science. Yeah. And that's one of the things I'm trying to peel back a little bit. The, the messaging, obviously, that, that we're trying to do communication-wise uh, is important about the process itself. Six warmest year on record, what does that mean for people? Um, one of the things I also want to unpack a little bit more is, is about Landsat 9. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people in our line of work are very familiar with the geostationary satellites. They're, you know, we're, we're doing the weather with these geostationary satellites. But can you speak to how something like Landsat 9 is different than you know a basic geostationary orbiting satellite. Oh yeah, so um, the, there's a, there's a wonderful uh, sort of synchronicity between the the geosynchronous satellites that are so far away, as you know, they can see the whole planet at once. And so with those, uh, you know, in the case of the uh, the GOES satellites that NOAA runs and that, that that NASA launches with NOAA, you know, we have them stationed all the way around the planet, so that you know wherever you are, there's a satellite looking down on the whole Earth. And so if you see a hurricane forming off the coast of Africa, you can track it. You never lose sight of it all the way around as it as it goes around. Around. But then something like Landsat is much closer to the Earth. I mean, these are what we call in, in, in low Earth orbit. And so Landsat is, you know, say, you know, on average, maybe about 300 miles above us. And it gets a much more detailed view of the Earth. And, and, and it's not just Landsat. I mean, I mean, we're amazed that it's Landsat 9 now, the ninth in that series, which means we have this very high resolution, in-depth record of the entire land of the Earth over 50 years. It's nearly, nearly 50 years now. But um, we also have other satellites that do things like, uh, you know, st study uh, very up close the water vapor in hurricanes or the oceans or all of that. And they're only, you know, about, a little bit above the altitude of the space station, you know, around about 300 miles. And so you get a much clearer view. So with, with, with Landsat, I mean, you have square mile by square mile pictures, you know, over, you know, over the last, uh, well, and it's actually even better resolution than that, but I'm just saying. Yeah, I was going to ask you, see... how much better is the res resolution now than in the first generation in terms of, you know, square kilometer, mile? That's right. Well, so, I mean, I mean, I mean nowadays we say the resolution is a little bit less than a baseball diamond. So, okay. so I mean, if, if you can kind of think about that sort of level, I mean, that, that would be sort of a pixel on the Landsat image. But what that allows you to do is, I mean, you can see how glaciers are retreating. You can see how agricultural patterns are changing, how, how, how forests are retreating, all of that. Very detailed over a long-term trend. Whereas the, the, you know, the geosynchronous satellites show you the big picture and what's happening, what's coming in a couple of days as these storms go around the planet. So you, you need all of them. You, you need the very long-term records. Uh, I mean, we, we have ISAT-2 that we launched. Um, ISAT-2 shines a laser down uh, and, and, it, and it bounces a laser off everywhere on the earth to an accuracy of the thickness of a pencil. 
And so we can actually see individual tree and canopy layers. We, we can actually see reefs, you know, tens of feet below the, uh, the water, all from this green laser bouncing down. So, we, I mean, we can actually track the height of everything on Earth down to that resolution. So, you know, all the way out, give you the big picture, all the way in, look at the little changes and, we, and everything in between. I, I love that so much. Uh, a couple of things about that. We talk about, you know, laser LIDAR. Why don't people not, see, this is, why do people not see the lasers? I mean, that's one of those <laughs> things like, I think you and I kind of kind of do that, but we've been so deep in it. But to the, to the average person, you know, they think about a laser, you're, you're bumping lasers down. How come we're yeah. not getting fried? Could you just talk to that a little bit? Well, in fact, it's one of the most powerful lasers ever built. I mean, I mean, there, there are more powerful ones than some of these like nuclear energy labs, but this is a big laser and it's a green laser. It's a visible light laser. And but OK, so for one thing, it is about 300 miles up. And, and that laser goes down through lots of cloud layers. It goes down through, you know, I mean, everything that's in the atmosphere. And it's incredible to me. So, I mean, it, it gives off hundreds of bursts of this laser per second. And, and when, when, it, when, when it actually reaches the ground, there are only a couple photons, just tiny little bits of light that actually get all the way to the ground and then scatter back up to the satellite. The interesting thing is you can see it under the very, very specific circumstances of being somewhere very dark and very clear. And if you know exactly <laughs> where it's going to be. So um, I have friends, for example, that do ground truthing in Antarctica. We're Ooh. studying the ice level of the ice sheet at Antarctica. And we need to make sure that this is very, very accurate. And so they go there themselves. They put down a little reflective cube and then they measure what the real altitude of that is. And they can actually see if the satellite's data is perfectly correct. And uh, they tell me that if you look up on a dark night in Antarctica, you will see a tiny little green flash in the sky. Yep. And I'm assuming this being a, it's a polar orbiter, so it goes around yes. the same spot twice a day? That's right, yeah. So, so, I mean, the whole point of a polar orbit, so the Earth is turning. And, you know, a lot of times people think about well, things like the space station are largely going around the equator. That's how we used to launch satellites. But if you launch a satellite that goes from north to south, goes around the Earth that way, then the Earth itself turns underneath it, and you get to see the whole planet. Whereas if you're just going around the equator, you, you usually miss bits up by the poles. And of course, you know, the, the, the polar areas are where we're seeing the, some of the largest uh, instances of climate change, glaciers melting, you know, huge changes. So we, we really want to make sure we have great coverage of the poles. That's why we launch these things into polar orbits. You get to see the whole planet and you definitely get to see the poles a lot. Coming into this as an astronomer with an astronomy background, a little bit different than a meteorology or more traditional Earth-based, you know, surface Earth-based science background, how do you look at planetary warming perhaps a little bit differently? I think you know, all the scientific community kind of understands what's going on, but I mean, and I apologize, I don't know your, your, your forte in astronomy, if it's planetary is it, or pulsars, I'm not sure. But as an astronomer, how do you kind of see, how do you kind of see our planetary warming signal maybe a little differently than, than some of your colleagues in the traditional Earth science? Mm, that, that's a really interesting question. I don't think anybody's asked that. I love it. So um, yeah, my, my actual research is in massive stars, the kind of stars that blow up and form black holes and neutron stars. But I've also taken and, and taught, you know, a lot of classes in, um, in planetary science. And, uh, and now, of course, we know of thousands of planets around other stars in the sky. The thing that I, I think that being a scientist, maybe people don't realize, uh, climates on planets change so easily. So, you know, both Venus and Mars used to have climates like the Earth in the sense that there was liquid water, a nice, friendly, warm atmosphere, all of that. And uh, both of these worlds, in this case, naturally lost their habitable environments. Venus became this hellish environment where it's 900 degrees, and the air pressure would crush a spacecraft pretty much flat. And, you know, Mars became this cold desert because the atmosphere leaked away into space. So the, the habitable the habitability of a planet is not something to be taken for granted. And, and relatively small changes, you know, will actually tip the balance in terms of making a planet habitable or not. And we've seen nature do this, but in this case, it's very clear that humans are doing this. You know, our climate change records go up exactly with the greenhouse gas emissions of people. You know, I mean, although last year was, like you said, the sixth warmest year, the other thing, of course, to note is that of the eight years, you know, the, the, the last year and the last seven years, those eight years together are the eight warmest years on record. So even though there's a little bit of scatter in, in the plot, the trend is really clear. We're, you know, we're going up. And it turns out that, you know, a planet's climate really can be balanced on a knife edge. And we've seen nature tip it one way or the other. And so, yes, of course, humans can tip it, too. 
You know, we are putting huge amounts of different gases into the atmosphere that naturally occur. That's going to change things. So I think being a scientist, you know, I, I never thought that a climate on a planet was something that was so solid and strong that nothing could change it. We, we, we see them changing in the solar system all the time. Yeah. And, and real briefly, I think for, for you and me, this is kind of obvious, but how do we know it's us that's doing the warming? It's so obvious to scientists, it's hard to even pick one way. You know, so, so as I said, I mean, you can map this change in temperatures exactly. I mean, the curve just follows exactly to how we're inputting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It starts when humans start, it goes up with the, you know, the, the slope that humans are admitting them. But, you know, there's, there's also things like we see the way weather works differently. You know, there, there were times in the past where carbon dioxide levels were naturally higher in the time of the dinosaurs. But it seems that when we look at the climate records, you know, first the temperature of the earth changed due to some reason, then the atmosphere responded. Now it's going the opposite way. Humans are changing the atmosphere and that's changing the way the, the land is. There's, 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 there's some ways that are so obvious, like just watching the charts and the curves go up and some ways about how, how weather works that it's now being forced in different directions from what we're putting into the atmosphere. So there are, there are so many ways. It's honestly kind of hard to pick one. Yeah, and real briefly, because I know we're almost out of time, I think I read at the climate, uh, NASA climate site that the rate of warming planetary wide is roughly eight or 10 times faster than coming out of the last interglacial. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. is that about right? Eight to 10 times faster? So yes, it's been, because I get this a lot. Well, it's been warming since the ice age. I'm like, well, it's warming yeah. eight to 10 times faster now than it was in the ice age. I just wanted to-, to it, 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 it is nothing like the natural records right. of, of warming after the ice age, nothing like it. Um, yeah, I mean, th those were changes. I mean, people think the ice ages are so extreme. Everything was glaciated and all that, but those are changes of fractions of a degree over decades and centuries. And, and, and when, you, when you sort of map what the changes were naturally over the ice age, then you see what's happening with us. It's, it's, it's absolutely different. It's a completely different curve, different response. Uh, Earth's climate naturally absolutely does change. It's been warmer in the past. It's been colder in the past. But this is a change completely precipitated by human activity. And, and that is clear. I mean, that, that's something people have to really understand. That, as I mentioned, you know, scientists love error and scatter and, oh, your measurement's a little bit different than mine. That's really interesting. Why is that the case? We, we, we sometimes get so blinded by these wonderful little details that we like to pick out that we, don't, we, we sort of forget to make the, the, the point very clearly. Yes, this is human-driven climate change, and it will continue and get more extreme as long as we're pumping more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere.